All right, let's continue on with chapter 1415. <clears throat> so remember last time I talked about how, you know, it's kind of a perfect storm as to whether when you encounter a pathogen, whether it can, you know, go down that continuum um, to leading to, you know, an infection and then disease. Um, so it really depends on the health of the host. Um, and then also, you know, how much of that pathogen that they receive. So, um, you know, we've heard a lot in the COVID-19 infection about protecting vulnerable populations. And that's basically um, what's listed on um, the slide here. So uh, being elderly and being a baby, okay? So baby, especially preemies, um, their immune system has not started to develop yet. So that's gonna make them very susceptible. And our immune system kind of, it wears out as we age. And so you probably hit your peak um, immune system function in your 20s. And then after that, yeah, the efficiency is gonna start going down. And so people who are elderly, yeah, they don't have a fully functional immune system just because of age. Um, obviously, you know, a person can also have genetic defects or mutations in genes that code for proteins important in their immune system. Um, a person can have an acquired defect like um, having HIV, which can produce AIDS. And remember the cell specificity of that is it attacks cells of the immune system and that's where your immunity comes from. Um, people who are recovering from surgery, certainly who have had organ transplants because they're being given immunosuppressive drugs so that they don't reject the organs that they have just been transplanted in them. And then, um, you know, pre-existing conditions. As we get older, we have different, you know, health conditions that we encounter, whether maybe our liver doesn't function 100%. Um, we have type 2 diabetes. We're a cancer survivor. We have hypertension, those types of things. Um, you know, as I mentioned, immunosuppressive drugs, being on chemotherapy, which kills fast growing cells, um, which include your immune cells. And then really any of us, you know, we're all immunocompromised at some, uh, to some point all the time. And for you guys, it's really due to physical and mental stress. Stress can have a very debilitating effect on your immune system. And Lord knows, um, you know, pretty much everyone in the world is going through incredible mental stress, you know, whether it's, you know, economic or, you know, having to quarantine with people who are driving you crazy. Um, so yeah, absolutely. That is having an effect on all of our immune systems. And then also other infections. So, you know, if you are fighting, you've been fighting a sinus infection for a while, well, that takes a toll on your immune system and then maybe it opens the, the door for you getting some type of secondary infection, you know, like a, a viral infection, simply because your immune system is worn out from, you know, trying to get rid of the other infection. So these are some different um, things that can affect your immune response. So in the last video, I talked about virulence, okay? So virulence and pathogenicity mean the same thing. And it, it's, you know, virulence is basically what is the degree of pathogenicity? So for example, you know, Ebola had a very high virulence. Um, you know, once it was established in someone, it was, you know, usually fatal um, within about 10 days. Some people did survive it, but there could be other reasons for that. So yeah, the, you know, the really scary pathogens and certainly COVID-19 is included in that are very virulent. And what these organisms tend to have in common is they have physical characteristics called virulence factors. So if you can remember way back to, um, I believe it was in either chapter three or chapter four, where I talked about capsules and envelopes and I showed you a couple of, um, photographs of organisms that have really thick capsules. Um, capsules, remember, make it hard to get medications into the cell to potentially kill the cell, you know, antibiotics. Um, they can also allow it to evade the immune system because capsules and envelopes tend to look like our own lipid bilayers. Um, those would be examples of virulence factors. 
Um, if the organism is producing enzymes that break down cell membranes, um, some organisms secrete collagenases, which allow them to burrow into connective tissue and to get in between cells. Those are all examples of virulence factors and, you know, organisms that are scarier and more virulent tend to produce these kinds of things. But remember, healthy individuals share widely varying responses to the same microorganism. So you could get the exact same amount of virus coughed onto you and maybe you won't get sick, but the person standing next to you that maybe they were having some type of other infection or maybe undergoing even a higher amount of stress, um, they could be susceptible. So a lot of it has to do with the host as well. So step one of this process, and remember we talked about this being a, a continuum. First of all, the microorganism has to gain entry into the host, okay? And we're gonna assume for this discussion, um, we're gonna talk about human portals of entry. So normally the way that an organism gets in is the place that usually has lots of normal flora in the first place. So whether it is, you know, a mucous membrane such as your nose, you know, the respiratory route, um, you know, any type of mucous membrane, or if there's, you know, a cut in your skin, it has to first find a way to get in. And remember, these definitions are important. So the infectious agent that's coming from the outside is called an ex exogenous microorganism. Endogenous infections are usually opportunistic infections, and this is where the pathogen is already in and on you. So we're gonna talk about first organisms that enter via the skin, okay? So the good news is if your skin is intact, it's really tough, okay? Because you've got that outer layer of keratin, which is a really tough protein. You've got an outer layer of dead cells. They're, in fact, I don't know of any microorganisms that can just float through the air and land on your skin and be able to just, you know, secrete enzymes and burrow through your skin. So it has to be, whether it's a cut, you know, it's a hangnail, it can be uh, a mosquito bite, you know, and the mosquito is serving as a vector, that can happen. So um, here are some examples, and you do not have to know these species for the exam or a quiz. I just want to point them out to you. So of course, you know, we've talked a lot about Staph aureus, who was our bad boy. Yeah, um, Staph aureus, if it happens to gain entry via a nick in the skin or a cut, yep, it has the uh, ability to be very pathogenic as opposed to Staphylococcus epidermis. Streptococcus pyogenes, um, is usually present in your throat to some extent, and that's what causes strep throat. Um, and then we have a couple of uh, a respiratory organism and then also two um, organisms that cause sexually transmitted infections. So the good news is really hard to get through intact skin. The bad news is, guess what? These are microorganisms. So it's not like you have to have a gigantic gaping wound for them uh, to make entry. It can be chapped lips. It can be just dry skin. Does not take uh, a very large opening for them to gain entry. Okay, now think about things that you ingest um, either as food or drink or, you know, um, you know, medications possibly. That um, anything that you're putting into the gastrointestinal tract. So the good news here is that our stomach acid is basically pH 1, which is the pH of concentrated hydrochloric acid or, or sulfuric acid. So the majority of pathogens are going to get incinerated once they hit that stomach acid. However, there is a growing list of organisms that have developed mechanisms to be able to survive your stomach acid. And that could be if it's a virus having a really thick envelope um, that allows it to, you know, make it through the stomach and then maybe the envelope is digested away, but the actual virus makes it into your intestines. Um, organisms like Salmonella, Shigella, 
certain bad strains of E. coli, remember most E. coli is good for you and it's great that it's in your intestines. Um, you can also have parasites like Giardia and especially, um, you know, Giardia produces cysts and tapeworms can produce cysts and they actually exploit your stomach acid because um, they allow the cyst to be eaten down to the point where once it makes it into the intestine, then the protozoan or the little baby worm can come out of its little shell and then cause infection. But the vast majority of pathogens are gonna be just incinerated or obliterated once they hit that stomach acid. So that's, that's good news. So by far the most common portal of entry is the respiratory route. And this is why COVID-19 is so deadly because guess what? We have to breathe, right? So, you know, something that is spread maybe by blood or body fluids, um, you know, that would have to be more of a caregiver or really intimate contact to be able to spread that pathogen. But the fact that COVID-19 is very virulent and it's spread by the respiratory route is why it spreads so rapidly. Um, simply because you have to breathe. You don't have to eat and drink all the time, but you do have to constantly breathe in and breathe out. And so the greatest number of microorganisms are going to enter through that route. So whether it's, you know, whooping cough, um, you know, strep throat, measles, mumps, uh, varicella zoster, you know, any type of bacterial, fungi, or viral pneumonia. Um, so most organisms that are going to um, enter are going to be via you breathing them in. Okay, the, the least common portal of entry would be the urogenital portals of entry. Um, so mostly these are sexually transmitted diseases, you know, HPV we've talked about, um, herpes simplex 2, chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis. Um, and normally you have to have, you know, pretty intimate sexual contact where you have body fluids exchanged. But, um, you know, uh, the urogenital portals of entry, it is a mucous membrane. And so that's, you know, the easiest way for organisms to get inside you. But important thing to remember, by far the most number, you know, the number one portal of entry is the respiratory route. Um, I just want to point this up, uh, you know, just to kind of give you an example of how many sexually transmitted disease infections there are. Um, absolutely do not memorize numbers or don't memorize these in order. Um, just want to show you that HPV, yep, that's still the most prevalent, even though we have a vaccine for it. Some people choose not to get vaccinated. And also, there are many, many strains of HPV. And so each time the, the vaccine improves, it's effective against more types, but um, you know, it still occurs, um, as do well these other infections. All right, let me stop there. I'm at 13 minutes. I'm going to get this uploaded and we'll continue on here. Thank you.